All right. Got a few uh, attendees. So we might as well get started, I guess. Um, I'll just uh, get a few reminders uh, out of the way, I guess. Um, feel free to, in the Zoom chat, introduce yourself uh, uh, and say hi. Um, also, um, we would encourage folks to, in Zoom, if you look at your, uh, uh, update your, your name to make sure it says something reasonable. Uh, and maybe has your affiliation if you want. Um, I think we're going to be so there's the, the Zoom chat, but there's also the on the Kiko chat page. There's the uh, Google Doc. We'll probably use that for uh, taking notes and stuff and asking questions, maybe answering them during some uh, of the discussions and during the presentations, and then um, uh, and then save any that we don't get to for after each session or after each talk or at the end of the session. So I suspect, or I hope we'll have a few minutes after each uh, talk to answer one or two questions anyway, and then we can go uh, after that. Uh, what, what else did I want to make sure I mentioned? Uh, oh yes, the uh, ESIP uh, community participation guidelines. Um, are down uh, in the second section there, or there's a link to them in the second section of the uh, Google Doc on the Kiko chat page. And um, just by participating in this session, you basically agree to uh, follow those, which kind of is, you know, be respectful, professional, inclusive, and welcoming, all that normal stuff. So uh, ESIP and CF are all about community and uh, community participation. So uh, be good, do good, all that stuff. <laughs> okay, uh, so I thought I'd just start off with the kind of the main goal of this session, to me anyway, uh, is to introduce uh, folks to CF, the CF conventions for NetCDF, um, and make sure everybody understands that this is a community effort that, uh, and everyone here, uh, everyone interested in or uh, participate, uh, interested in CF is encouraged is part of the community and is encouraged to participate and uh, Daniel's going to uh, at the last session uh, last talk is going to go over some of the process around uh, uh, advancing CF and governance and stuff like that but uh, main takeaway I uh, want everybody to have from in my eyes is uh, that this is a community effort and we want you all to feel welcome and I encourage you to contribute to CF as you can. So um, the agenda is there at the top of the uh, Google Doc. Uh, David's just going to give a quick introduction to CF conventions for NetCDF and then uh, talk about the data model, uh, which abstracts away some of the NetCDF parts of that. Um, if we have time at the end of the session, perhaps we'll be able to talk about how the NetCDF data model and the CF data model uh, have been contributing to or allowing us to uh, look at other file formats and cloud storage and czar and the like and how those fit together. So uh, that's for the end of the session. Um, Allison is going to talk about CF standard names and the process for what they are and the process for uh, moving those forwards. And then I think this one will be interesting. Roy is going to talk about one of the somewhat recent and still being having some uptake, I guess, is uh, how CF standard names are using biological taxa standards to uh, leverage an external standard. Uh, and that one should be interesting. Uh, and then again, I mentioned Daniel's going to talk about the, uh, the community, the governance, the process around CF. So uh, as I mentioned, we should have time after each talk for a question or two. And then, uh, as I understand it, we have this Zoom room for the rest of the day. Basically, it's available. So if there's a uh, continuing conversation, uh, some of us will be staying on. Uh, we've even talked, a few of us, about uh, maybe a virtual happy hour, uh, clinking some uh, beer glasses together virtually. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, David. Thanks, uh, Ethan. Um, I'll just attempt to share my screen. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, can you can see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Okay. So uh, as Ethan says, I'm just going to try and give us a, a quick whirlwind uh, tour through uh, CF, um, which hopefully will be useful if you're not so familiar with CF. Uh, and even if you are, I found it very useful putting this together, even though I thought I was very familiar with CF, to go back and uh, visit some of the uh, stuff we tend not to think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and this is uh, some uh, slides I've put together with Jonathan Gregory, who uh, we work both at uh, in the University of Reading. Okay, so uh, a good good as any point to start, I think, is with uh, NetCDF um, in going back in the, the history. So uh, as we are, as we as we know, NetCDF is is very good for storing self-describing array orientated scientific data. And what that essentially means, uh, to me at least, is that within the same file, we can keep our data arrays, the stuff we really are interested in, alongside the metadata, which describes our data, tells us what the numbers actually mean. So NetCDF is very flexible and imposes very few rules on what the metadata you can put in the file mean. And it says stuff about, you know, you, you can put metadata of various data types and so forth in, but what's exactly you put in is very much up to you. And there are uh, a few uh, rules about some interpretations, but not many. But this is a, a strength, I think, of NetCDF as it uh, allows the, the file uh, format or dataset format to be uh, applicable across just an almost infinite range of um, applications <coughs> uh, and communities, um, which is, I guess, one of the reasons why it's been so successful. Uh, However, within a community in particular, um, knowing what, firstly, you you yourself did 10 years ago and what other people in your community are doing is very important, obviously. And, and so when uh, you're looking at old data or sharing data, um, it's very useful to know what you've got without, A, having to ask, because um, that could be quite tedious and possibly, well, not possible. Um, and you just want to know what you've got. And if you don't have a good guideline of what you, you've got in a data set, you might be tempted to make some assumptions from what you can read in it. And someone else might make different assumptions. And we've got this sort of problem where nobody quite knows what's going on. And I, I may be exaggerating slightly, but that really is the uh, sort of the use case for uh, creating something like the CF conventions. So. CF essentially defines extra rules to to uh, on top of NetCDF, which are particularly good at describing uh, the metadata we use for storing geoscientific data sets. And so not only does it give a definitive description within the file of what we've got, uh, uh, it also say solves this problem of, of sharing data. I can give you a file and you can just read it and know exactly what's in it without having to um, to ask me essentially. And it also, given a, a stable standard that says in the file, this bit means this and that bit means that and so forth, it allows us to, to develop software to manipulate our data sets. And this is pretty important, al although many of us don't develop software, but we all use software to interact with our net CD CDF data sets at the end of the day. So having uh, a standard to which software can be built on is also very important. So uh, it's good to look at an example of, of what this is all about. So what I've got here is a, uh, is a CDL, a text representation of a small net CDF data set. And on the right hand side, we've got some data arrays. We've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven variables which have data and all the numbers are listed there. And on the left hand side, we essentially have the metadata which describe those data arrays. So we've got some attributes and some other things and some dimensions and so forth. So this is uh, this is a quite a small but um, not an uncommon uh, net CDF file. So where do we start? What have we got in this file? What, what do we know we've got? So we know it's a net CDF file, so we can apply the few rules that NetCDF does give us to try and make head or tail of it. And 
Um, by my reckoning, these are the bits I've highlighted in yellow. So NetCDF tells us that we've got some dimensions um, and it also tells us uh, that, and I won't go into the details because uh, I don't have um, too much time in this talk, but it also tells us that we've got some variables lat and lon, which contain coordinate values of latitude and longitude. And it tells us that those latitudes and longitudes apply to the variable x down near the bottom. Um, so the values of x can be geolocated. Um, and it also tells us that the x values are non-dimensional, they have units of one, but that's about as far as NetCDF goes. So I know I've got some numbers that can be assigned to locations on the sphere, but not a lot else. So that's good, but we need more really to uh, be able to analyze our data. So if I were to add in an extra part to the file, uh, a file level global attribute that tells us to look at this file uh, according to the CF conventions, so it's saying use the latest version of CF, CF 1.8, then we can say a whole lot more. So these areas highlighted in blue uh, are what CF is giving us on top of NetCDF for this data set. So it's telling us, for, for example, that the latitude and longitude coordinates aren't just um, uh, points in space, they're actually representative of, of cells that have bounds. And it also tells us that the time variable um, applies to the x chord, uh, the x variable um, as, a, as an extra temporal coordinate. It tells us that x is actually specific humidity values, uh, not, not some other physical quantity. And also that the, the values of specific humidity are area averages of the cells defined by the other variables in the file. So now we know quite a lot quite a lot more about our, our data, um, which is great. And as I said earlier, CF builds on NetCDF. Uh, so what NetCDF defines is inherited by the CF conventions. So really we can cover it all, color it all pale blue and say that everything in this file that's blue is, is given a definitive meaning by the CF conventions. Now the one bit that's missing there is the uh, project attribute of the of our variable called x, which has a value of research. Now, this is uh, not something that CF tells us what it means. Um, it's something that's um, e that's extra outside of CF. But CF is absolutely fine with that. It's it says we'll define a whole bunch of stuff that's useful. And if you want to put extra stuff in your file that means something to you and your small your smaller community, that is absolutely fine. So really, even though the project attribute isn't given a meaning by CF, it's perfectly uh, in keeping with CF. And so we can say that this file is, is CF compliant. Every part of the metadata is either interpretable directly from the CF conventions or is, uh, or is known to be outside them in, a, in an allowed fashion. So that's great, um, <laughs> essentially. By, by putting the uh, conventions attribute in the file, the global attribute, it allows us to the CF conventions to kick in and we can uh, get a lot more information from the file than if we were just looking at it with a, uh, an uninformed NetCDF perspective. So, so how, do, how do you know how to do all this and, and to interpret the file? Well, the bottom line is you've got to read the CF conventions, um, uh, possibly. Now they're very long, as you can see, 183 pages is the latest version, um, the PDF version that's uh, on the um, available on the website. And the meaning of of uh, of what's going on uh, with the metadata is often obscured by the encoding details of NetCDF. So in this little snippet I've put in here, which is just cut and paste from the CF conventions, it's a single sentence that's uh, pretty horrible. Um, it's got a lot of format stuff and uh, colons and two different types of brackets and stuff, uh, basically. And I, I feel justified putting this in because I was partially responsible for this sentence going into the CF conventions. So I'm allowed to say it's not very nice. But the point is that there's a lot of detail, which of course is necessary, but it, it, it's obscuring the fact that what this sentence is really going on about is the fact that we're allowed to have multiple horizontal coordinate systems applying to uh, the domain of uh, the geolocation of our data. So that's kind of the, if you knew that, that would help. 
Um, um, unfortunately, in the CF Convention's full document, there's nothing really that says anything at that sort of high level. We're talking about this now, and here's some detail about how we put that into a net CDF file. But help is at hand with the uh, recent inclusion uh, into CF of the CF data model, which gives us uh, that higher level um, understanding, uh, we hope. So the CF data model is, uh, well, the CF data model or any data model is essentially, uh, it's breaking down a system into its fundamental building blocks and describing how those building blocks relate both to each other and also to the real world which they are representing. So it's uh, it's it's very much trying to uh, look for the simplicity and the relationships within CF without all the uh, 183 pages of detail. So such a such a model um, not only gives us a better understanding of, of of CF metadata, it should also allow us to create better improvements, enhancements to the CF conventions, um, and also uh, coming back to the software. Um, it's very, it'd be very, it's very, it is very useful for software developers to, to use as a building block, a starting point for creating more CF complete software. So there's lots of good that could come out of having a data model. And before we have a look at the data model itself, it's worth having a quick look at the design criteria that were applied in its construction. So it should be necessary and sufficient good mathematical concepts, uh, concepts, I think. So necessary, we need to make sure we've got the, the right, uh, a number of elements or building blocks, which can represent any conceivable CF, uh, next CF data set. Um, um, and on the other side of the coin, it should be sufficient in that we, uh, the building blocks should be able to represent CF as it is now and not um, anything else and not add extra complexity that may cause um, that it's not currently needed that may cause problems further down the line. And the last point is is a very important one. It should be a logical data model. And by that we mean it should be independent of any encoding. And in this case, the encoding, there is only one encoding currently of CF and that is the net CDF encoding. So this takes a lot of the, uh, the uh, complexity um, away from the data model that doesn't actually affect the relationships between the uh, its fundamental elements and also would sets the groundwork as Ethan was uh, saying for applying CF to uh, other file formats uh, if and if or when the need, need arises. Um, all you have to do is start with the data model and say so long as I can represent the data model in this other format I can represent CF. You don't have to do any of the uh, detailed unpicking of the net CDF um, encodings. So this is uh, the CF data model. So instead of 183 pages, we have essentially this picture. And of course, there's a bit more to it than that. Each of these boxes is backed up with uh, two or three paragraphs of text, and there are some supplementary diagrams. But we're talking more like four or five pages rather than 183. And these green boxes are the elements, the building blocks of the of the CF metadata. And there are, there are nine of them, and we call them constructs. And the central part of the central construct is the field construct at the top, in the, the top green box, which um, essentially relates to a CF net CDF data variable. So the variable X, the specific humidity variable in my previous um, data set example. And the other eight constructs are what I call metadata constructs. These are all parts of uh, parts of CF which are which uh, exist to describe the data stored in the field construct. And there's there's two sort of categories of these. There's essentially those that belong to the domain, uh, which are the uh, sort of the bottom uh, six. So these are the constructs which serve to locate our data in typically time and space, but uh, any um, physical or non-physical dimension also. Uh, and that's where much of the complexity of CF lies. It's in the location of our, of our data arrays, of our data array values. Now I could, and I would like to, I think, spend a lot of time talking about each of these boxes, um, but I'm not actually timing this and I, I know it's quite a short talk, but I do have, which hopefully gives you a flavor, a put on the, and there's a lot on here, 
but I've put on the mapping of the data model constructs in green back to what are possibly more familiar CF net CDF elements. So the, the names in the blue boxes should be quite familiar to you if you're familiar with the CF conventions. Um, so what you can see here is really the, the maybe the take home messages is uh, there's quite a lot of one to many and many to one relationships between the green and the blue boxes. Um, so in particular, if we look down at the, uh, for example, the, um, the auxiliary coordinate and dimension coordinate boxes in the towards the bottom on the right, we can see that they have uh, variously related to three different types of net CDF elements. Uh, 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 to CF net CDF elements uh, in, and, uh, and teasing out some of these relationships is really the, the, the work of, of creating the data model. So I think the, the, main, the main point is the data model exists and it's useful as, a, as an orientation and understanding CF and as I say will, um, is, is useful for development work going on for the future of how CF uh, may be represented. Okay, and that's uh, all I've got to say. Just uh, if you want to find out more, because I know I've, I've only skipped over a lot of the detail of the data model, um, there's there's two places to go for, um, but firstly, the, the, the second bullet point here is the, the data model is now, the canonical description of the data model is now inside the CF conventions as of the next release, but the draft is available online. Um, uh, and a more complete uh, description with much more background and work like uh, relating the CF data model to other data models uh, in the uh, same uh, apply to uh, the sort of geoscientific world and so forth is being written up in a freely available uh, paper uh, also online obviously. So uh, if you're interested in finding out more, please have a look at those. Uh, and that's all, thank you very much. Thanks, David. I'm not seeing a lot of questions in the chat or the Google Docs, so it must have been very, very clear what you were. Excellent. <laughs> I'll buy that. <laughs> <laughs> any uh, any questions uh, out there? Anybody you'd like to ask? We're a little ahead of what's on the agenda, though I did intend oh. to shorten my sections, uh, so maybe we're good. Sorry, was that somebody talking? I'll ask a real quick question there, David. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, the the other data models that that you discuss in your 2017 paper are they just solving different challenges, or are they just other attempts to solve the same problem? But that's now all historical. Um, it's it's a bit of both. So we compare it with, for example, the Net CDF classic and enhanced data models, which are definitely not trying to solve the same problem. But we also look at comparisons with uh, the the ISO. Um, the ISO uh, data models, uh, which are in the same sort of ballpark. Um, so, and there are lots of similarities, but there are also some differences uh, in, in, in approach, which are sort of uh, useful to keep distinct um, because of the way that CF is used. So, um, so we're not just reinventing the wheel, we think. Okay, and just to follow up on that, and I, you may have already said this, is is your data model now inc included in the draft for CS Conventions 1.9? That's right. So okay. it's it's yeah, it's been it's gone through uh, as a as a as an enhancement, and it's been prepared to be standalone as an appendix in the in the CF Conventions. So when the next release, it's ought to be in them, but the it's already in the draft. Oops, uh, I'm, I was muted. There's a comment in the chat uh, uh, about asking if you can elaborate a bit on the uh, CFDM Python package uh, that implements the data model. Oh, sure. So, so this is something that uh, that I I develop. Um, so this is a it's a it's a reference implementation of the data model. So it's not a fully fledged analysis package, but it can essentially read and create and write and do some simple manipulations on any conceivable CF compliant data set and any that aren't and many that aren't compliant. Uh, so it 
implements the data model exactly as from those green boxes with all the same arrows and so forth. Um, and we're good to go. So it's quite lightweight and and it's quite a bold claim that it can uh, it can successfully in, you know interact with any conceivable uh, data set that, that may or may or does not yet exist. But so far that is uh, shown to be the case. Uh, so it's quite powerful, I think, and um, I do encourage you to uh, have a look. Great, thanks. Um, I guess we can save any other uh, questions about the data model and CF basics until uh, the end of the session. We'll um, move on to uh, Allison's presentation on standard names. Thanks, David. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ethan. So I guess I just need to share my screen first. Yep. There it is. Okay, just Thanks, go Allison. presentation mode. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so yes, I'm going to speak about the CF standard names which are essentially a controlled vocabulary uh, governed by the CF community and that sit inside the wider framework of the CF conventions that David has just described. Uh, so today I'm going to split my talk into two parts. So firstly, I'm going to cover some of the fundamentals about standard names, how they're used within the CF conventions, what, what is a standard name, first of all, how they're used within the conventions, uh, how do we write standard names, and then I'll give a, a brief step-by-step -step guide on the process for proposing a new standard name. Because as been uh, explained already, CF is very much a community-driven standard. And I think it's useful uh, to show people on a practical level how they can begin to participate in the discussions that we have and, and the processes for um, modifying the conventions and the standard names. So let's start by looking at the standard names themselves. So what is a standard name? So essentially it's a label to identify geophysical quantity that is stored inside a net CDF data variable. So the example on the slide is air temperature, but it could just as easily be seawater temperature, seawater salinity, sea ice thickness, cloud cover, and so on. So basically any quantity that scientists are interested in modeling or measuring. So these are scientific parameter names. And we make the association between a data variable and an appropriate standard name using a very simple mechanism, which is illustrated by the example on this slide. So we have a standard names attribute. Uh, and in this example, uh, we have a variable called PSL. And as we've already said, net CDF variable names in themselves are not standardized. So they don't always give you a lot of information about what's actually stored in your data. But here we've assigned a standard name of pressure at mean sea level. And standard names are standardized because they are meant to be uh, processed by machines, but also to be human readable. And the primary purpose of a standard name then is to facilitate data sharing and data exchange by providing unambiguous identification of the variable. And then a data uh, user who may be using uh, data from separate sources so for example, climate model data and some in-situ temperature data can be really confident that they are comparing similar quantities and that their comparisons are scientifically valid and meaningful. The list of standard names is held in what we refer to as the CF standard name table. And the table gets updated approximately six times per calendar year. The most recent version being version 73 that was published in June of this year. And that currently contains 4,422 uh, separate quantities. And there are further 40 standard names that have been proposed and are under active discussion, but haven't yet been included in the published table. So if you were to look at the standard name table on the CF website, they'd be presented pretty much as shown in the graphic here. So there's three main components to the standard name. So there's name itself, the units of measure, and then some description text that gives more explanation about the geophysical quantity that's represented by the name. Uh, you'll notice that the units are SI units and here they're labeled as being canonical. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by canonical units in, in a moment. Uh, 
But first, let's look at the fundamental rules for the standard names themselves. The first thing is, if you label a variable using a standard name attribute, the value of that attribute must be chosen from the published standard name table. So it's not CF compliant to use a standard name attribute and then just make up a, a value for it that doesn't appear in the table. Standard names consist of letters, digits and underscores. So there's no white space in there. As we've seen in the examples already, the underscores are used to separate the words to make the names more human readable. Uh, the names are written in the English language with US spellings. And it's important to note that they are case sensitive. Now, in most of the existing names, we've chosen to stick with lowercase letters, but we have an exception to that uh, in names where we include an international chemical element symbol, like the example here on the slide. So 112AG is an isotope of silver, and here it makes sense to allow mixed case in the standard name. So case sensitivity is a, is a feature that's allowed. Most of the standard names that are in the table do have an accompanying description. Just a very few of the oldest names don't, but we're trying to add definitions to all of those. And then the final point on this slide is a very important one, which is that once a standard name has been added to the standard name table, it never gets removed. And the reason that we want to do that is if we say we want to update a name by correcting a spelling mistake, for example, or updating the terminology that's used in the name because terminology in the scientific literature may have moved on. We can do that, but by changing the standard name, we don't want to invalidate large quantities of data that may already have been written using the existing name. We don't want to require people to have to rewrite their data simply because CF has updated one entry in the standard name table. So we have a deprecation mechanism to cope with that. What we do is we keep a record of all older versions of standard names. So we can update the name itself, but any older versions of that are kept and stored uh, in what we refer to as aliases. Okay, so I mentioned earlier about the canonical units. Now units of measure are very important and go hand in hand with the quantity described by the standard name. So for example, if you have two similar measurements of uh, the abundance of CO2 in the atmosphere. One of them has units of kilograms per cubic metre, and the other has units of moles per cubic metre. Because they have different units, they need different standard names. So the kilograms per cubic metre would go hand in hand with the standard name using the phrase mass concentration, and the other one would be described as a mole concentration. Now, as we saw uh, in some earlier examples, uh, the units have their own CF metadata attribute. It's simply called the units attribute, and that is string valued. Um, and so the reason we, we talk about the units as being canonical um, is because the units that you use in your data file actually don't have to be identical to the canonical unit published in the standard name table. They need to be dimensionally equivalent. So for example, the canonical units of most temperature quantities in the standard name table are written as Kelvin. But if you have measurements that are in degrees Celsius, it's fine to, you don't have to convert all your data to Kelvin, it's fine to put them in your data file and label them with a unit of degrees C. And this is because the, the CF conventions uh, place great emphasis on using the Unidata UD Unit 2 package for handling unit information. So provided the unit string that you supply in your data file is something that UD units two can recognize, and it's something that's dimensionally equivalent to the canonical unit, then a conversion uh, can be made. And that's absolutely fine. Your file is MCF compliant. It's worth mentioning some things that shouldn't be included in the standard name, uh, because there are other CF metadata attributes where we can store certain aspects of the metadata. So, in particular, numerical coordinate information belongs in coordinate variables, and you can have scalar coordinate variables if there's only a single value. And this is to avoid a situation in which potentially we could have an infinite number of standard names for what is essentially the same geophysical quantity. So if you think about air temperature, we could define a name for two meter air temperature, another for 10 meter air temperature, 20 meters, and so on. 
But instead of creating all those separate standard names that differ only in the value of the vertical coordinate, we simply choose to use the air temperature standard name and store the coordinate information elsewhere. Uh, we take a similar approach with statistical uh, operations. So often scientific data will have been sampled at some time interval or over a geographical area, and it will have been processed to create a mean value or to find a maximum or a minimum, for example. This type of statistical information belongs in the cell methods attribute rather than in the standard names. In fact, cell methods can be used to describe some very complicated statistical processing. Uh, for example, the mean surface albedo over just the snow covered portion of a climate model grid cell, for example. It would be very hard to fit all of that description into the standard name. And it's much better described using the cell methods attributes. And as we've already seen, the units information also doesn't belong in the standard name because it has its own attribute. So these are just a few examples, but the point of this slide is that quite often new users, new users of CF attempt to try and cram every possible bit of description of their data variable into the standard name. So what I'd call the kitchen sink approach towards metadata. Um, but actually it's better not to take that approach because we can actually write much richer and importantly, much less ambiguous metadata by making use of the other CF attributes. I just quickly wanted to show this slide um, because it's got the, the link to the published versions of the standard name table on the CF website. The table is available in a couple of different HTML versions and also an XML version. Um, and you can always view the most up-to-date version, of course, but we also preserve older versions of the standard name table. So the whole history of how standard names is developed is, is available on the, on the website. Okay, Allison, just so, so you know, you're about 10 minutes in, so about five more minutes to go. That's fine. I'm just moving on to the, the second part of my talk, Ethan. So hopefully we'll Thanks. stay just about within time. Great. Okay, so, so I wanted to talk about the, um, the process for proposing new standard names. Uh, you might want to do this if you're a data scientist and you've developed a new data product that just, just isn't adequately described by any of the existing names on the table. So the very first step you need to do is to make an account on GitHub. And I suspect that many of the people listening will already have one of these accounts and be very familiar with GitHub. But for anyone who isn't, I just say that it's a very widely used platform for collaborative working, it lends itself very well to community driven, driven efforts such as CF. Uh, and you can sign up and make an account for free, and you just need to provide a minimal amount of uh, user information, such as a, a username and email address to get yourself started. So once you've created a GitHub account, you need to navigate your way to the CF Discuss repository. And the link is shown at the top of this next slide. So many of the CF community discussions take place in this forum, and this is the correct place to propose a new standard name if you need one. Discussions all take place inside GitHub issues. So I've highlighted the issues tab here. And when you click on that tab, you'll see one or more pages of issues listed. Now they won't all be to do with standard names, but those that are will often have this sort of lilac colored standard names labels. It's helpful to be able to pick them out from the list. And the other important point for news is, is to make sure that you are watching the Discuss repository so you can toggle this on and off. If you watch the repository, it means that if you create an issue to propose a standard name, you will then be emailed uh, anytime anybody makes a comment on your proposal. So you don't always have to log into uh, GitHub each time to see whether the, the proposal is making progress and see what comments people are making. So to make a new standard names proposal, the first thing we need to do is simply make a new issue. And that's done very simply by clicking the green button on the top right of this list of issues. And then you're given the opportunity to select a template for your new issue. At the moment, I think we only have standard names set up as, as pre-made templates on here, although others might be added in the future. Um, so you can just click the get started button. If you really don't want to um, use a standard names template or even, indeed any other template, there is, a, there is an option at the bottom to open a blank issue if you want to uh, completely start from scratch. Uh, but for now, we'll concentrate on the standard names template. So when you, when you open in a new issue, the template itself is really quite simple. Uh, so you can edit the title up here. It's useful to put some meaningful information in there. And then the, the main text window just contains some reminders of uh, where to get information about the discussion process and also the types of information that's useful to include in your proposal. 
Um, I would say that if you want to propose more than one name, which people often do, so say you've got 200 names that you want to propose for different chemical species, please group them together all in one single GitHub issue. Please don't make 200 new issues or 200 new names. Um, but once you're happy with your proposal, just click on the submit new issue and that will be added to the discuss repository and then the discussion process can begin. Now I won't go through this in huge detail because I know that we are short of time. Just to say that there, there is a, a formal procedure, there are some uh, formal rules on how the discussion proceeds and the link is given in this slide. Essentially the pr process is that any member of the community may comment on the proposals, indeed they're encouraged to do so, and the proposer is asked to respond to those comments and answer any questions that come up. And the whole aim of the discussion is to achieve consensus. We have two people, myself and my colleague Francesca Eccleton, who will act as moderators in those discussions to just to keep things moving forward really and make sure they don't get, get stuck and hung up. Um, if it, well, once a name has been agreed by consensus by the community, it can be formally accepted and it can be published in the next update of the standard name table. If, uh, in the unlikely event, we really can't reach consensus, there is a mechanism for asking the Standard Names Committee to take a vote on whether standard names should be accepted or not. I have to say that's very much there as a backstop and we've never actually had to resort to that yet. We've always managed to reach consensus so far. And then I just wanted to finish up by uh, with one slide just saying uh, what we have uh, going on at the moment with, with standard names and the development of them. And as I've already said, the standard name table continues to grow. So names for modeled and observed quantities continue to be added. I'm sure they will continue to be in the future. A few standard names are now being used as pointers to external, as in not managed by CF uh, vocabularies. And a couple of examples where we're doing that are what land cover and biological taxa. Uh, and this allows us to benefit from the work of other scientific communities. And I know Roy is going to talk about biological taxa more in the next talk, so I won't say any more about that. And then one more piece of work that's taking place at the moment is we are planning to publish standard names as an ontology uh, within a CF namespace. That's something that the community have requested and we're hoping to be able to take that forward in the next few months. And I hope I've managed to stick to time, so I'll, st I'll stop there. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is about the, uh, the, the standard name browse URL uh, supporting keyword search, and I believe the answer is yes, but comments on that? <laughs> uh, in, the, in, in the, yeah, so if you go to the standard name table on the CF website, if you go to the, the main sort of HTML version of the table, there is a search box in there. And right. yeah, you, you can type a name or part of a name and it will it will show you all the names that, that match whatever right. happens is in there. Great. And uh, let's see, and a question about uh, use of CF standard names outside of NetCDF files, and Daniel says he's seen them in databases. Uh, any comments on that, uh, Alison? They are used in other places. Uh, I think that's great. That's one of the better, because they, I think one of the original ideas of CF was that the principles behind the design of the metadata, although NetCDF files were very much in mind, a lot of the principles could be applied to other standard data formats. Um, I do know of another uh, of a text file format, an ASCII file format that is used within my own organization, uh, CEDA, um, that, that uh, basically is, is just for one dimensional data or two dimensional data, so it's data in spreadsheets, but they do use CF standard names as part of their conventions. They've, they've taken that on board. Um, so they do turn up in other places. It's quite surprising, pleasing in some ways, and quite uh, stunning to me as well, how often standard names do turn up all over the world. Um, but right. this is why we want to be very careful about defining them well and making sure that they are they are accurate and properly described. All right, I think uh, there's a few comments and then another question. Uh, does the CF organization have accepted rules about abbreviations? Uh, generally speaking, we don't have, a, if we mean abbreviations for whole, whole standard names, then basically we don't use abbreviations. So there isn't a short version of the standard names themselves. Um, we do use one or two abbreviations within the standard names just to make them a, a bit less lengthy. Um, so, for example, we say we have some names that say things like TOA, which is short for top of atmosphere. That's often used in meteorology. So there are some understood 
uh, abbreviations in there. But no, generally speaking, we don't have short versions of the standard names themselves. All right, and uh, and Katie asked that question and, and mentioned that she had seen TOA. So there we go. Uh, okay. Right. Understood by at least some subset of the. That, that uh, it should um, any any abbreviations that are used in the standard name should be explained in the description text. If you go to the standard name table and click to reveal the descriptive text, any abbreviation that's in there should be fully explained. Um, so there should be nothing in there that's mysterious, I hope. Right. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks, Alison. I think we can save any, anything you. else uh, to after the, uh, uh, or at the end of the session. So um, uh, Roy, if you're ready, we'll move on to your presentation. Okay, let's try sharing the screen, see what happens. All right. What's happened? Anything? Uh, nothing yet. <laughs> no? Oh, share, right. There we go. Yep. yep. Right, hang on. Right click there. And Click there. Yep, we're running. Perfect. Okay, so here's Alison's talk in a bullet point. <clears throat> so CF labeled measurements using a controlled vocabulary of standard names, which Alison just told you all about. It's the content government that serve the standard names in formats like RDF that um, are may maybe <clears throat> more suited to technical trickery. Now, expanding the control vocabulary needs resources, <clears throat> both in the community to uh, discuss the new standard names, and then Alison and Francesca still have to do a reasonable amount of work to add each standard name. If you go for massive expansion, not only do you um, swamp the available resources, but you could even bring down some of the technical governance servers. When you look at biological data, they quite often have one measurement per taxon. I mean, a fairly typical biological data set might be the species distribution map, in which case you've got abundance of a couple of hundred different species um, and its spatial distribution. As well as abundance, you can have tens of measurements, biomass, carbon biomass, um, nitrogen biomass, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have tens of measurements, hundreds of taxa, the, uh, you, you, you really could. I mean, Alison said there's 4,000 odd standard names. You could easily add another 20,000 at a stroke. So it, it, it really was threatening massive expansion. <clears throat> So when I saw um, around 2012, 2013, the biological parameters were starting to come into the standard names, um, I put together this proposal to avoid the vocabulary expansion by considering the taxon as a data coordinate. That means if you've got a simple species distribution map you can store that in a 3D array, latitude, longitude of the obvious coordinates, but you then have the third coordinate, which is the taxon. So you have one layer for each taxon, each layer being a 2D lat long abundance array. Each coordinate has one or more auxiliary variables that need to be populated. So with latitude, it's quite obvious. You cut <clears throat> populate it with a number that is your latitude, longitude again. Taxon needs to be populated. And you also need to give standard names to both the abundance values within the variable and to each auxiliary variable. Now, each element in each of the taxons represents um, what is in one of the map layers. The obvious label to use is a piece of text that is the taxon name like um, 
Colonus Finmarchius or something like that. The advantage is it's nice, easy, human readable, and it's got no management overhead. The disadvantage is, is these names are long, Latinized, and very, very easy to misspell. They're also subject to naming variations. I don't know why, but quite often you have um, a different Latin ending, either US, abusivus there, or abusiva. Both are valid names for a particular type of hoverfly. <clears throat> so there's also the potential to populate them by total garbage. I did receive one um, data set for submission into the BODC databases. There was a spreadsheet, and each column was labeled with a pet name that is what the taxonomists call a particular species of copepod. <coughs> so we decided to include the plain text, despite its flaws, because it does make the data file self-contained, which fits in with the principles of CF, i.e. data files are self-contained. And the plain text was given the standard name biological taxon name. Now, okay, that's the plain text. We can have more than one auxiliary variable for each taxon. So we have plain text in one. How about using the, a second one for a machine readable standard conformance taxon label? And if such a label can connect into some kind of machine readable taxonomy, it's even better. I mean, the nirvana for biological searching is to enter a search term like copepod and find data tagged colonus finmarchicus or whatever your favorite copepod is. <clears throat> there are well managed internet resources that provide taxa with permanent identifiers and these are integrated into a taxonomy. So as well as getting a label for your taxon, you also get um, for the species, its genus, family, et cetera, et cetera, right the way up the uh, taxonomic hierarchy. These per permanent identifiers may also be incorporated into resolvable URIs. By that, I mean, it's something you can form it as a URL and something sensible comes back down the wire. It may not be human readable, but it can certainly be machine readable. And, okay, so what you can do is, as well as having the plain text name, you can have another text string variable that's populated either with a PID or with a URI that is based on one of these PIDs. So, okay, what we decided was that the sources of the identifier for the URI need to be approved by the CF community. Initially, two were chosen. One is the World Register of Marine Species that's managed on behalf of the OBIS community by Liz in Belgium, and um, that's got very, very good coverage of marine flora and fauna. However, CF isn't totally marine, and so we looked at a second source of um, standard identifiers, and there is the International Taxonomic Inter Information System, ITIS, that comes out of the Smithsonian um, in Washington, D.C. That's got very good coverage of terrestrial flora and fauna. However, this is just the two we chose to start with. Others may be proposed for consideration through the GitHub mechanism that Alison described. Okay, Worms gives each taxon a permanent identifier known as the APHIR ID. ITIS gives each taxon a permanent identifier known as the taxonomic serial number. Both of these identifiers may be incorporated into a set of URIs that resolve through service APIs 
provided either by worms or ISIS. <clears throat> the initial idea was that maybe we should have the plain text, then an auxiliary variable for worms IDs, and then a third auxiliary variable for um, TSN based URIs. It, we, that would end up with sort of being gappy. You'd need absent data for where you've got, you'd have your worms element absent for a terrestrial organism and your itis element possibly um, absent for your um, marine organisms. However, following feedback that this wasn't very neat, we looked and decided to use the life science ID syntax as a single vehicle that can cover, carry either um, an Athian ID or it can carry a TSN. So here is the, the yeah, generalized syntax. So you have an authority, a namespace, an object identifier, and an optional version. And there, that's an example of one using an AFIR ID. Um, there is an example of one using a TSN. <coughs> the URNs may be converted to URLs by using a prefix, which is given there. The auxiliary variable containing the life science IDs has been given the standard name biological taxon LSAD. The abundance array, each individual value inside the data array is given the standard name. Number concentration of organisms in taxon in seawater. So having this in taxon bit there means that um, the taxon isn't defined. It's saying taxon is defined elsewhere. Now, LSIDs are not universally loved, um, but they provide the practical way to combine APIR IDs and TSNs into a single variable that is machine understandable. Other identifiers, either PIDs or URIs, <coughs> could be incorporated into additional auxiliary variables. Each variable added needs to have a standard name, Agreed for it, again, using the GitHub procedure as Alison described. Um, the first time this extension's done, there needs to be a few tweaks to the text in the convention document, fairly minor amendments, making sort of singulars, plurals, and this kind of thing. To date, I'm not aware of anyone using this mechanism in anger, but the oceanographic biogeochemical community is being very much steered towards CF in a number of fora. Um, for example, the uh, CDHO, the, the carbon dioxide database is moving towards CF. Um, the C data net in Europe. These are moving towards CF. Biological data will be stored. And so I think this mechanism will have its day in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Uh, great presentation. Um, uh, and you kept it under 15 minutes. Thank you. Perfect. And now we're kind of back on schedule. I think I chatted too long between the last uh, set two uh, talks. So um, let's just move on. I think it might be interesting to talk about. I know uh, 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 chemical components and stuff are used. And maybe, Allison, we could talk about, uh, well, OK. Could this be a mechanism to point to additional vocabs outside of taxons? So yes, I think that's where uh, things this conversation could lead. And let's uh, save that until at the end of the session. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a little time to get back to that. But uh, I think that's that's uh, an obvious next question. Um, so, uh, but in the interest of uh, time, let's uh, move on to Daniel's talk, and then we'll uh, try to come back to that uh, topic at the end of the. Uh, session. Daniel, you uh, ready? Yes. And thanks, um, Roy. OK. Yeah, thanks very much, Roy. Uh, I'm just pulling up my screen now.
Okay, I think this should be visible now, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, now we get to probably the most interesting of possible meta topics, which is how do we, um, how do we keep the standard uh, in a good shape? Uh, so we've talked about a lot of really cool features of CF. And uh, I think it's been demonstrated also that CF has grown and evolved with time. Uh, and this is to the benefit of the community. And uh, um, of course, I meant it kind of ironically that governance is probably the least interesting thing, but I think it's actually a really important aspect of making sure that the conventions stay relevant and useful uh, for all of our, our users and uh, that our user community can also grow. Um, so, I am going to try to breeze through these slides uh, fast enough that we have a lot of time for a discussion, but not so fast that it causes anybody uh, to, um, uh, to to lose track of what I'm talking about. And uh, But definitely fast enough that we shouldn't get too bored. Uh, so please just uh, raise your hand or something if I'm skipping over things too quickly. Um, the structure of this talk will be, um, uh, who's involved in CF governance, what processes are used in order to keep the, the, um, the conventions up to date and relevant and useful, and uh, how that is implemented technically. And I've noted that that's very easy. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because we're on the same platform that many other communities have moved to in recent years, which is GitHub. So I think many of the people in this room will be familiar with that. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why, for that part, I won't be zooming in too close to details. Um, so who are the stakeholders? Who's involved in, in CF governance? I like to think of CF kind of like a tree because I love trees. And uh, at the crown of the tree here in our example, we have a bunch of interesting things. So there are leaves and twigs, branches. Uh, you could say that uh, fruits are kind of the material outputs of uh, of of the work in CF. And so if we were to say that this is a group of people that are involved in CF governance, that would be the community, right? That's you, it's also me. Anybody who's sitting in this session right now uh, is involved in, in CF governance because you are part of the community. So you're using CF in some capacity and uh, therefore it has interest to you. And I think this is the most exciting part of the tree example because it's at the tops of the trees that all the squirrels live and the delicious fruits and flowers and stuff are. And also where you can see out farthest to the horizon. Uh, so it's the community that is a real strength to the CF conventions, I think, because uh, it's people from the community who have this kind of wide view of what's coming on the horizon, where else we could go. Um, what other interests we will need to take account for uh, and how we need to evolve. And uh, the crown of that tree or the community is supported and participated in by uh, the trunk, or if we stick with this, um, with this metaphor, that would be the committees and the support team. So the job of the trunk or of these bodies is to make sure that there's proper support there for the community and also make sure that it has a good foundation upon which it can stand and build on. And then the last part is the roots, uh, which I've labeled as the governance panel. Uh, they're supposed to provide um, provide the, 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 the basis so that the trunk can do its work. So keep things grounded and uh, basically make sure that the rules that the different committees and teams use in order to support the community uh, are really conducive to being effective and for the uh, for the standard to evolve in a way that is useful to the community, inclusive and fair, and uh, conducive to its uh, to its further use and spread. Um, and oh yeah, so to go back to stick with this example, so it's pretty obvious who's in the community. I said that's all of you plus everybody else who's using CF. And uh, not only would it be kind of tiresome to have a list of everybody who's ever come to a session like this. Um, it would also be entirely impossible to maintain who all makes use of CF because many, many people use CF without even knowing that it's a, it's a thing that they're taking advantage of. And that's great. That means that the support for the standard is quite widespread and it's intuitive to use. Uh, but we also have a list of all the people who are in the um, these more official bodies 
And you can find that if you go to the CF website, I've made a screenshot of it here. And under governance, you can find out who at any given time is or was in any of these bodies. Uh, so it's not a secret. And I'm about to tell you how you can uh, be more involved if you're interested in these, these bodies. So let's talk about what they do. Um, we talked about the conventions and standard names committees. So these are that tree that I just showed you. And uh, both committees have secretaries that do a lot, a lot of the legwork um, and a chair that they share between the two of them. And the members of both of these committees can, I, can become members either by self-nominating or being invited. And when you become a member, you are a member for five years or until you quit. And at the end of that, you can renew your term if you like. Uh, but there's also an easy opportunity if you've moved on in your role or whatever to uh, to go on to do something else. Um, so there's no limit to how many times somebody can renew their membership in a given committee. Um, but it is more of an opt-in type of thing just to uh, try to ensure that people um, who are in the committees are really interested in uh, being involved. Um, so it sounds really great. Uh, what to, to be a member of the uh, CF conventions or standard names committee, um, what it actually gives you is sadly not a scepter or any kind of special powers, uh, uh, but it's also not a lot of commitment. So basically, if you're in one of these committees, um, you can voice your support for proposals to make changes, such as adding standard names or making changes to the conventions text. And uh, Although people outside the committees can voice their support and that matters in the change management process that we have, uh, support is needed from at least one committee member in order for something to move. So if nobody from any of the committees is interested in supporting a given proposal, that proposal um, is very unlikely to be adopted. And moving down towards the more boring parts, the governance panel is another body, it's a little bit smaller. Um, it has a chair, uh, Ethan's the chair, um, and the members are um, set up to provide representation from organizations that are contributing a lot to CF and also to make sure that there is representation from the conventions committee. Uh, the members of the governance panel get appointed by the panel and they have the job to promote the use of CF uh, to set up the governance processes to, so that they are um, useful in maintaining the conventions. So that's what the governance panel does. Okay, so those are the people involved in uh, the governance process. What are the processes? Uh, Allison already told you about the standard names process, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, I'm going to show you here, or I am showing you here, the process to make changes to the conventions text. And that is the scary activity diagram that you see on the right hand slide with uh, six lanes. Uh, it's actually not that scary and it's not very complicated. In summary, if you kind of roll through with me from the top to the bottom, uh, going through the different roles, somebody proposes a change. Uh, there is a moderator who volunteers to moderate discussion around that change. Uh, discussion comes from the wider community. So that might involve people from the different committees or might be just interested people. It doesn't matter. Um, and when a given proposal has been discussed for a while and has solidified so it's not changing anymore, then if there's consensus, it gets adopted. Um, and also if there's support from at least one person from uh, the conventions committee, and if not, generally it won't get adopted. So it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, and this is the most complicated process uh, that exists in the world. Um, what I'm not showing here is the process for correcting errors because that is streamlined. And I've also not included on this diagram the fact that when changes are made to the convention's text, we also check that for consistency with the data model moving forward because as David was saying earlier, the data model will be part of the, um, of the conventions in all future uh, versions. So it's really nice to have that data model, but the data model doesn't really help us if we allow it to diverge from what's actually uh, prescribed by the text. So if you understand this process, which as I said, I hope is fairly straightforward, we try to improve it, um, then you're probably wanting to know, to know how to get involved. And we've implemented this using GitHub. 
What I just showed you is a snapshot of the current rules, but if you're wanting to know how things work at a given point in time in the future, that might have changed. So I suggest you look at the repositories contributing.md file. That's like a standard place to say how to contribute to a repository. And what it will currently tell you is for all of these, uh, for all the different types of changes that you might be interested in making, you raise an issue uh, and generally a given topic will be one issue, not multiple. Uh, there will eventually be a proposal in the form of a verbatim text change that's proposed. That is a pull request. Somebody will volunteer to moderate the discussion. And when that pull request is agreed, it gets merged to master. And at some point that gets tagged and that's how the release process works. So I've linked in some examples here. Um, these examples are just different stages of proposals. And in the interest of time, I won't open these up, but I wanted to provide them as reference. Um, we have three repositories in total that are interesting. One's called Discuss. It's for general discussions, also for proposing standard names. And the link there is to a question that really um, bore fruit. So a lot of volunteers got involved in the discussion and are doing a lot of technical work that will eventually lead to uh, a proposal to change part of the conventions or to add something to it, uh, but it's not quite there yet. The second link goes to uh, an issue uh, to uh, that is proposing some changes to the conventions. And the third link goes to a pull request showing the concrete proposed change. And so this is all available uh, for you to take a look through. I really like using pull requests for proposing changes because it's very easy to see exactly what is meant and it's very, very traceable. Um, so, and again, if you have trouble navigating any parts of this process, check in the contributing.md file. It should help you. And if it doesn't help you, then just raise an issue and ask. Uh, we're a very open and welcoming community. And my experience is always that there will be somebody who's willing to help out and uh, provide some guidance if it's needed. Um, okay, so we've got these processes in place. And like any processes, they can always be improved. And uh, so we work on that as well. Uh, and what I would like to illustrate here is that we just had a community meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there were several outputs of that community meeting. A lot of them were scientific or technical, um, but some of them were related to the governance process themselves and uh, or itself. And we take that seriously. And uh, so that has resulted in the creation of a board where we can track the progress of these issues as they get followed up. So the process will be any actions that were generated from the meeting are currently cards. And when we start following them up, they get turned into issues and we can track them through the Kanban board to make sure that we are really um, acknowledging and following up on the needs of the community. Which means uh, we'd really like you to be involved uh, because the community is what makes CF strong and relevant. So I've got three links here. One is to the discuss uh, repository where you can raise issues and basically use it as a forum. Use that if you have any questions about CF, uh, about anything at all, software, um, how to interpret the standard. You can also just drop a line and say hello. You can propose new standard names. The second link leads to the repository for the conventions. That's where we maintain the conventions. And if you want to propose a change, then pop by there and propose the change. And if you have an idea of how to improve the governance processes, uh, that is kind of strangely housed on the website. Uh, so that third link takes you to the repository of the CF website. And the reasoning behind that is that the website holds the rules for making changes to the CF conventions. So that's the best place to house that. And with that, um, all I can say is, we really hope that you get involved and uh, I'd be happy to see all of you on GitHub uh, maintaining the CF convention soon. That's it from my side. Great, thanks Daniel. <clears throat> um, not seeing a lot of questions. Um, I'll just mention that uh, the uh, all the slides uh, or at least uh, possibly an earlier version of them are available on the uh, the session page in the ESIP meeting uh, agenda. So on the sketch, uh, sketch.com. And I'm actually uh, sharing a link to that in the uh, chat. And uh, so all these links uh, uh, that Daniel's uh, mentioning are available there. And uh, all right. 
So we have 15 minutes left in our normal uh, conversation. Let's see, were there any specific questions about the governance? Uh, I no. see one from Ken. Uh, so Ken asks, does this mean oh, all requested go. changes require the requester to make changes to ASCII text? Um, that would be really cool. And that actually works out pretty well in practice. Um, but if anybody is not fluent in ASCII doc, um, we've had instances where people have proposed text directly in an issue, and then somebody helps them to integrate that into the document themselves. Uh, so I would say it's encouraged, but not required. Yes, that is, I would say I add to that. That's how it's going to happen, but uh, but we don't require that everybody understand how to do it, and we're happy to. People will be happy to help. So, all right. Um, any other questions on governance and the process? Um, and then we can jump to some other topics if we want. Not seeing anything. So um, uh, I guess um, there was the question on, uh, could the uh, uh, a mechanism that uh, Roy uh, described for the taxons uh, and standard names, could that be used for other, uh, other types of vocabularies? Uh, so, Roy, do you have any comments on that? Or I know uh, it seems like that conversation comes up every so often, and uh, uh, but I'm not sure if there's been much else. And Allison, you mentioned uh, what was it, regions or uh, land types? That was it. And uh, I guess I didn't realize that was using a similar mechanism. So. Anyway, either of you, Roy or Allison, comments on that? Well, all, there is certainly the principle there. Um, I would love to see it happen. It basically needs, I mean, storing the links in um, data variables is one method of doing it, and it works well in the use case of where you... <clears throat> um, have an obvious coordinate that you're trying to describe, but it's also possible to add um, parameter um, attributes and to put linkages to vocabularies in there. Now, I have actually done that in CDataNet in the NetCDF format I designed for the CDataNet project. <coughs> And that uses the fact that CF allows other attributes to be there that aren't part of CF. So I set up a C data net attribute namespace and put URIs into vocabularies there that um, do things that are useful for C data net using the, um, the voc vocab server we run. Um, now, there was a suggestion at the that at the CF workshop, that that be standardized in some way and that there be a standard mechanism to add permitted vocabularies, linkage to permitted vocabularies through attributes in the CF namespace. Um, there was also the suggestion for what I regard as anarchy, which is to use something like the ISO 19115 mechanism, where you define a standard that allows any vocab without any kind of vetting or any kind of management process to be linked, which worries me a little. Um, and that could be kicked off in a ticket. If someone has the energy to champion it and take it through, it could be set up in a ticket, discuss, and it, it, it's not a difficult thing to do. Right. Um, 
Allison, any uh, comments on other, uh, have there been other efforts around that? Around uh, oh, you, like- You mean to add, add other vocabularies? Yeah, other, in, in a, have a standard name that references uh, some other vocabularies or can be used to do that. The, the only examples so far are the tax on names and the land cover name that I referred to. So this was a, a the land cover one was, uh, it, it points, I think, to a United Nations sort of land cover uh, sat satellite data set. So this, this was really for satellite data for land use. Uh, and again, there are vast numbers of classifiers there. Uh, so those are the only examples that we have so far, but that's not to say that there won't be other useful vocabularies that we should point to. I'm certainly open to the idea that CF uh, doesn't have to include everything into standard names and govern its own vocabulary for absolutely everything. We probably don't have the right expertise just in our community. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be sensible, for example, for us to start coming up with tax on names when they already exist and the biological community have already taken care of that. Uh, so I can well see that there may be other cases where we want to do it. Uh, and Roy's right that we did start talking about this at the CF workshop. Um, I, I think the, the conclusion from that was that we would have to take each vocabulary on a case by case basis. So if somebody wanted us to point to a particular vocabulary, we would need to be sure that that vocabulary met certain conditions. So for example, that it was managed according to fair data principles and so on was, was well governed. Um, and, and so there, there would be certain um, standards, if you like, that those vocabularies would have to reach. But assuming that they did, um, then I'm sure that we wouldn't be resistant to pointing to, to other vocabularies that are out there. Great, right, yep. Sounds good. Um, all right, uh, other questions? Um, there was a question about groups. I see you answered it. Daniel, do you want to expand on that at all or say any more details? If I no. can unmute myself, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, those are, there's some, um, I guess there, there are two things that are interesting about that. So groups, uh, I wouldn't, yeah, perhaps I phrased it wrong. Groups are allowed since CF 1.8 group. The use of groups is described since CF 1.8. And uh, that gives us a lot of flexibility because it guarantees that there's one way to interpret how variables are linked across groups. Uh, so that's pretty cool. The other cool thing is that we have a, um, uh, a net CDF flattener that applies the rules uh, from CF 1.8 in order to take a net CDF file um, and and remove the hierarchical structure in case this is needed for uh, software that doesn't understand groups yet. And this is called NetCDF Flattener. Um, and it's been published in its first version for a couple of months now. I just pushed out an update to that uh, where David Hassel contributed quite a bit and he's also been kind enough to package that up for Python, Python package index. Um, so if you have software that doesn't understand groups that might be a good way to work with it um, if you have data that does use that in CF. Great. Um, and just to circle back around, uh, thanks, Roy, for all your comments. It, it looks like there's been some activity in the discussion about uh, C data net and various things. Uh, so it looks like uh, I don't know if there's anybody uh, with further questions on any of that, or maybe you've uh, concluded that discussion already in the uh, chat window. Um, but thanks, uh, uh, thanks for everything. Uh, anything there to talk about or um, any other questions or comments? We're uh, closing in on the end of the regularly scheduled session. And uh, if uh, there's a takeaways document uh, in the uh, the Kiko chat for uh, that we can add something to my main takeaways are community, 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 get engaged, active in, uh, uh, active in CF. Yes, uh, indeed. Sutira, thanks, thanks to everyone. And uh, 
I'm going to just type in the notes uh, community and what else did I, did I say anything else for takeaways? No, I don't know. We'll think about that later. But um, any other final questions before we, I guess we have five minutes, four minutes uh, left. Any final comments? Any co questions? I think for the takeaways, uh, we can definitely see that there's a lot of interest in interfacing CF with other vocabularies. I think I saw somewhere, but I couldn't find it again. Somebody had mentioned uh, um, how does it link with ontologies? And I'm sorry if that got touched on enough. I wasn't totally paying attention there, but um, that was something that's related, I think. That was another discussion in the CF workshop that, again, I, I hope will lead to something, but these things, of course, <clears throat> where everyone working on a voluntary basis take time. Right, I think uh, Allison mentioned that uh, in her talk, there's been some talk, uh, discussion about how to expose the CF standard names, information about them in a more uh, ontology uh, linked to data kind of way. So that's still ongoing. There's probably some more discussion that needs to happen there. So. Yeah, I think some, some more work will happen about that in, in the next few months. Um, so the main Thing that's that's been requested is that we have a CF namespace so that you can point to a a, a URI to an individual uh, standard name, um, and that will have some, something that says CF basically in in, in the in the URI and the URL, um, because I think people feel that that's that way they know that they're consuming the if you like the right version of standard names, the accurate version, uh, and I think that's something that we can we can look at from a technical viewpoint. I think that'd be really helpful. And there's a huge bunch of folks that have been in these meetings over the last week and a half that, have, that are into that uh, ontology space. And you <laughs> probably, you know, if there's lots of, uh, lots of help around. Um, I don't see a peer in here, but, uh, you know, somebody who jumped right in, I'm sure. Yeah, we definitely, there was some mention of uh, the ESIP. Uh, now I can't remember what it stands for, CORS. Uh, something community ontology repository yeah repository right so yeah there's definitely some awareness there so yes it would be good to pull more people into that discussion and make sure we do it right all right uh unless there's any last minute converse uh comments questions i think uh we can kind of wrap up uh we may uh i don't know if anybody else feels like a beer I'm ready for one uh, uh and it's it's you know it's past one o'clock here in uh Colorado so it's 9 30 feel... over here <laughs> yeah, you're playing... <laughs> yeah you're going to bed and not I've, uh... I've been holding out as long as I can Ethan <laughs> <laughs> all right so some of us may stay on and chat a little bit longer uh but uh thank you to everyone for joining us and it's really useful and uh uh, thanks for all the comments and questions.